This video introduces client-side web frameworks, and in particular Angular.js, for students who are used to working with server-side web frameworks. Uh, we're going to explain a little bit about the difference and show how to build a very simple app in Angular.js. There's another video which uh, shows that demonstration app in action. So this diagram here, this is based on a UML sequence diagram, and this shows what happens between a browser and a server for a traditional server-side web application framework. So we've got the browser on the left and we've got the server on the right. Time is flowing down the slide, and so the, the, the line underneath the browser is time flowing downwards under the browser, and the line on the right-hand side is time flowing downwards under the server. And we can see the requests going from the browser down to the server and the HTML going back from the server to the browser. The blue boxes on the, on the left show the life of a page in the browser. The blue boxes on the right show the life of a request in the server. So we can see in our traditional web app, the browser makes a request down to the server. The server does some processing. It produces some HTML. It sends that up to the browser. Uh, the browser shows it. The user does something. That makes a request down to the server. The server generates some fresh HTML and it goes up to the browser as a fresh page that knows essentially nothing about the previous page that was showing in the browser. And so if you've used things like uh, JSP, Java server pages, or PHP templates, or uh, various equivalents, depending on what language your server-side web framework's written in, you've probably seen something a little bit, bit like this, where there's a fragment of HTML, and inside that HTML, we programmatically insert some data from our program. But that, in a server-side web framework, is kind of done once for that request. The, the JSP writes out the HTML, that HTML is sent off to the client, and that's the end of that request. On this slide, we've got what happens for a single page app, a modern uh, application that lives up in the browser. The browser makes a request down to the server, and initially the server delivers some HTML. Here is a fresh page to the browser. That HTML might contain some links to some JavaScript and some CSS. And so it loads up that JavaScript and it loads up the CSS. And from there on, this behaves like a little application running inside the browser. And so the browser then makes another request down to the server. But instead of requesting some fresh HTML, it's requesting some data uh, that's usually delivered in JSON, J JavaScript Object Notation, JSON, uh, back up to the browser. And the JavaScript that's running inside the browser is going to do something with that data. And then maybe the user interacts a little bit more and it makes another request down to the server for some more JSON. But if you look at the blue boxes representing the life of the page, this page is now long lasting. And these requests, instead of requesting fresh pages, they're requesting data to change the page in the browser. So we now have a long lived stateful page up in the browser and short requests for data down on the server. This means that if we are doing our templating now up in the browser, things are going to be a little bit different. So here is um, our example sh showing a span with my object.name in it, only this time I've used angular.js's templating format using double curly braces instead of less than percent equals as the JSP did. But now, Putting this in there isn't just a one-time event. We, we might write myObject.name in between this span, but what happens then if the JavaScript changes the value of myObject.name? Somehow, rather than just writing this into the HTML once, we need to bind that object value into the page so that when myObject.name changes, what's shown in the page also changes. And what about the other direction? HTML has things like text areas, inputs. It's got various different controls that the user can interact with, and they can change um, what's showing on the page. And we'd like to update the data in our JavaScript based on what the user is doing with the controls on the page. So these are a couple of the uh, extra things that we need to deal with uh, if we are doing our 
um, templating up in the browser. Uh, and so the, 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 those are a couple of the differences we have to deal with, as well as just the fact that it's now in JavaScript and it's happening up in the browser rather than on the server. We need to update the page if the data changes, and we need a way of updating the data from the user's interaction with the controls on the page. Something else we might want to consider is introducing an idea of components. HTML has some quite low-level tags. It's got paragraph tags, it's got div tags, it's got input tags, it's got button tags, etc. But these are quite low-level items on a page. Suppose we were building a social networking application. Perhaps we would want to talk about a user profile component, a component that we can put on different pages that shows the user's profile. Or we might want to talk about the login form component, or the menu component, or the wall feed component where people post messages. Uh, we'd like to be able to talk about these higher levels of components, but HTML doesn't natively have tags for them. So perhaps we'd like to introduce tags, teach HTML about new tags. So Angular.js is a client-side web framework that tries to do these things, plus, plus a bit more. So it has a component model, which it calls directives. Um, the, uh, these are based on the idea that you are teaching uh, HTML new tags. So you can have tags like your user profile tag. Uh, and it also does data binding in the template, so that if you, if you bind some data into the page and your data changes, the page will be changed accordingly. We're going to start by talking about directives. Now, directives are the part that is often said to be one of the most complicated bits of Angular.js. So we are diving straight into one of the most complicated bits of Angular.js, but it's not actually that complicated. So with the directive, we have this idea that we are creating a new element to be able to put into our HTML. Uh, a new tag name, or also possibly a new attribute for a tag name. We'll see an example of that later. This new element that we're creating, it can have a controller, which is some JavaScript that's responsible for setting things up. This controller is going to get called when Angular.js puts the R component into the page. One of the things that that controller has access to is a variable called $scope. $scope is a JavaScript object, and its role is to hold things that become available on the template. So if the template binds in curly braces name, then what's going to go into that HTML is the value $scope.name from within the controller. And a directive can have a template, which is some HTML to show for uh, some lower level HTML to show for this component. And that lower level HTML could in turn call other directives that we're going to define. OK, we will we'll see how this plays out as we go through our very simple example. So let's move on to templates. And so here at the top, we have a very simple example of a template. We've just got some HTML there, a label with a text ID in it. And then we have a span, and in curly braces, I've put profile.id. So what's going to appear inside that span is the value of $scope.profile.id. Now, the $scope object itself is actually created by Angular.js, and it is passed into our controller function as a variable by Angular.js. The directive, when we define it, we're going to declare, uh, if we want to, that this directive needs a new dollar scope object to bind things onto. But the controller, our JavaScript, can modify that dollar scope object that uh, that we're given, and it can set things like, OK, I'm going to set $scope.profile is my lovely object that's got an ID on it here so that it will appear in the template. We can also set some of those variables to be functions, which is how we're going to bind things onto the buttons. Because when if we're going to perhaps bind something, uh, bind a button to be uh, to submit, which would be uh, to call the function, which is $scope.submit. We'll see an example of that as well. Second example of a template, in this case, my HTML fragment for my template 
uh, has a tag name they wouldn't necessarily recognize. Profile details, that doesn't look like a native HTML tag because it isn't. That is the tag name that uh, is going to be introduced by another directive. And there's a convention in terms of the case between the name of the tag and the name of the directive. So the element, inside the element, we see this tag profile hyphen details or lowercase. The name of the directive inside the JavaScript uh, when, we, when we call into Angular is in camel case. Profile details with a capital D but without the hyphen. Another little example which we will see later on is we can have one component that has a dollar scope, it has a scope, and that could contain in its template, it could contain another directive that declares that it wants to have its own scope. And so now you've got two components, one inside the other, and they have independent scope variables that are completely unrelated to each other. We can, if we want, however, also tell Angular that we would like it to do some binding between some of the things on that scope for us. So in this in this invocation here, I've got profile details, profile equals profile. What's that about? Well, if we look down on the bottom bullet, profile details directive will declare scope colon profile colon equals. That scope declaration, it declares this directive wants a new scope, and it also declares on this new scope that you give me, I want you to bind the variable profile to, and then on the equals, uh, we could put some text after the equals, but we haven't, and so it's going to, define, uh, to, going to default to the name of the variable. So equal to, okay, let's remember the word profile, and let's go back up to the tag that invokes us, and we're going to have a look for an attribute with that name. Is there an attribute profile? Yes, there is. There's the attribute profile. What's it set to? It's also set to profile. So on the parent, there's going to be a variable $scope.profile. So what we've done there, it's a little bit long-winded. You can kind of see two, two layers of indirection. But what we've said is that this child component is going to have its own scope object, but scope.profile on the child is going to be bound to be kept in sync with scope.profile in the parent. Uh, so that is uh, linking two objects so that their data will kind of change in step with each other. You change it in one place, and Angular will change it in the other. You change it in the other place, Angular will change it in the first place. Let's have a look at some of the actual code for declaring a, de a directive so that this starts to get a little bit more concrete. And then we will see the entire application, which is only 130 lines of code, including all the HTML, including all the white space, including all the comments. It's really small. But let's see a directive. So here is some very small code for a directive. And you can see we go angular.module of GitHub profiles. So we've, we've got a name for a module that we're declaring our directive on. So just remember that for the moment. And we've declared on that module the directive profile details. And so that is going to be the profile hyphen details element. The second argument we pass to the directive function. So we say directive is called profile details. Here's the function to declare it. And that function returns an object. That object has some stuff in it that is going to set up how this directive works. Restrict colon e means this is the directive. This directive is an element. It's not an attribute. It's an element. Scope means this directive gets its own dollar scope object. Profile colon equals, as I say, that uh, that means on this new scope object you're going to give me, I want you to bind scope.profile to be equal to a, a variable in the parent scope whose name is going to be set in the attribute on the invocation. And then we have a template. And in this template, we can see we've got a paragraph, label user ID, and then in the span, profile.id, so that is going to bind to $scope.profile.id. Um, and then we've got some more HTML, and then down the bottom we've got curly braces profile. So that's going to bind to $scope.profile. Now, as you can guess, from there being $scope.profile.id, $scope.profile is a 
JavaScript object. So what's going to come out in, in that paragraph? Well, there's going to come out a text representation of that JavaScript object. So what we're going to get back uh, get put there is some um, JSON turned into text. The application that we, I'm going to show, uh, I'll explain what it is now. And it is a very simple thing that is going to make a call to the GitHub public API to look up a user. And it's going to get back the public data about that user, the public profile data about that user. We're not getting anything secret here. And we're going to write onto the page their ID and uh, the JSON data that the GitHub API returned for that user. So let's go on to uh, another directive. So this was the profile details directive. Let's have a look at another directive that's going to use this one. So here we're declaring the directive profile fetcher. And again, this is going to be an element. So we're going to see in our HTML eventually, we will see a tag profile hyphen fetcher. Only the line underneath, the next thing we've got is controller controller. So we are going to declare a controller for this directive. And we'll see that on the next slide. But for the moment, just remember that we're going to declare a controller and it's going to be well, it's in a variable called controller that uh, that we would have declared just beforehand. And then in here, there is a template. Uh, only there's a few interesting things to point out in this in this HTML template. So div classes form, div classes form group. That's just HTML. Label username label input ng model equals username. Ng model. That's not a native HTML attribute. That's another directive. But this directive is it's an attribute and it is one that is supplied by Angular itself for inputs. And this is the one, well, this, this is one that does binding from our controls back to our data. So what we're going to have here is we're going to have a text input that is the, uh, the content of the text input is going to be bound to $scope.username. So it will start with whatever the value of $scope.username is. And as the user is it edits inside that input, inside that text box, $scope.username is going to be changed to match whatever the user is typing inside that text box. On the next line, we have button ng click equals submit. This is another directive supplied by Angular.js. And what this one does is it says, I want you to bind the on click event of this button to call $scope.submit. Uh, so this is a binding from um, clicking a button to calling something that we are going to define on the $scope object in our controller. We keep reading on lookup button div 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 class equals alert and then we've got another one of these ng if equals status another built-in directive and this one says if $scope.status is truthy, that is, if you if we go if $scope.status, JavaScript considers that to be true, then we should show, uh, then we should include in the HTML whatever's in this tag. But if it is falsy, if if JavaScript considers if $scope.status is false, then this stuff shouldn't appear in the HTML. Uh, null is falsy, so if $scope.status is null, this div won't appear. If $scope.status has some text in it, well, text is truthy. So that, that div will appear, and we'll see the status uh, text appear inside the div. On the next line, we have the invocation of our profile details directive that we declared just before. And we've got the bindings. Uh, profile equals profile, which, as I've said, is going to link the $scope.profile in the child directive to $scope.profile in this directive. And we've got another built-in directive, ng show. This one um, shows this element if $scope.profile is truthy. Only the difference between ng if and ng show. With ng if, if it's falsy, it won't appear in the HTML. With ng show, if it's falsy, it will appear in the HTML, but it will have the CSS property display set to none. So it will be in the HTML, but its styling will be set so that it doesn't actually appear on the page in the browser if you look at it. Um, but it's still in the document object model of the page. 
Okay, let's move on and have a look at the controller. Now, hopefully things will start to, to kind of bind together in your mind, start to make sense, and hopefully even more so when we then look at our really short example. So defining a controller. Um, earlier I'd said that you know, in, the, in, the, in the object that defined the controller, we said there's going to be a controller and it's the variable controller. This is where I've declared it. And we can see that this, this controller, well, it's an array. The first two parameters in that array are strings, $scope, $HTTP. And these are naming things that our function is going to need. Uh, and so you'll then see that the function takes two parameters, $scope, $HTTP. I said that $scope is passed in by Angular.js. Here we've said to Angular.js that one of the things our controller function requires is $scope. Please pass it in. We've said that the other thing that our controller requires is $HTTP, which is a service. It's an object that has methods on it for making HTTP requests. And Angular.js is going to pass that in too. Uh, the reason that this is an array with this funny form of two strings and then a function uh, is kind of interesting. So if you said var controller equals function of dollar scope comma dollar HTTP, then actually that would work in development. Angular.js would look at the names of the parameters in your function argument list. Uh, see, oh, yep, yeah, that's dollar scope. I, I can give you one of those. Oh, that one's dollar HTTP. Yes, I can find a service uh, called dollar HTTP, and I'm going to pass you that. The problem, though, is that if you then minified your JavaScript, as many people do, they 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 uh, for production, they compress their JavaScript, removing all the comments and renaming the variables to things as short as they possibly can be to try and get the size of that JavaScript file down as small as possible. If you did that, then suddenly this would end up saying something like var controller equals function of a comma b. And angular.js would go a. I don't know what that is. I haven't got any services called a. This one's b. I don't know what that is either. I haven't got any services called b. And it wouldn't work. And so instead, they have this convention that you can do it by having an array where the first few entries in the array are the names of the services you need uh, as strings, so they're not going to get compressed. And then you have the function that takes them. So if this was minified, we'd get var controller equals array dollar scope dollar HTTP function of a comma b. But Angular.js would go, OK, that's a function of a comma b. But I can see from earlier in the array that a is supposed to be dollar scope and b is supposed to be dollar HTTP. And it would still work. So this format for defining a controller is a, a defense against losing the information about the dependencies if you minified the script. OK, but what does the controller actually do? Well, we can see that this controller is all about setting things on the scope and setting that up the right way. So scope.profile equals null, scope.status equals null. Well, realistically, even if I didn't set those, scope.profile would be null and scope.status would be null. But it is useful documentation for me later on to, to know, OK, I'm going to be setting those to other things as we do stuff. So that's why I've got scope.profile is null and scope.status is null at the beginning. Scope.submit, though, I'm setting to something. I've set scope.submit to be a function. And here's what it does. And so back in our template, uh, if we recall, there was a button ng click equals submit, and that's going to call uh, in the on click event that is going to call dollar scope dot submit. And here's me defining this is what dollar scope dot submit is. It is a function. And what does that function do? Well, first of all, it sets scope dot profile to be null. Uh, why does it do that? Well, at this stage in the function, it might not be null to start with. So we're going to set it to null, which is going to make profile falsy. And back on our previous slide, the profile detail, ng show if, if scope.profile is truthy. Well, if we've set it to null, it's falsy. So the profile details will vanish when we click the button. Uh, scope.status is the string fetching. Scope.status is now truthy. So in the line above, div classes alert ng if equals status so if scope.status is true that's going to appear and scope.status is now going to be the string fetching 
So that's going to appear and the div's going to contain the text fetching dot dot dot. So when we click the button, immediately the profile will disappear and the status text will appear and say fetching dot dot dot. And then we work out a URL as a string and then we call HTTP dot get on our URL. HTTP is a service that's been passed into our controller. Dot get is a function that is going to make an HTTP get request to that URL. Now, obviously, that get request to that URL is going to take some time. It's got to go out over the internet and take however long the network latency is, plus however long the server takes to respond, plus however long the network latency is on the way back again before it finishes. But the um, so the request is going to take some time, but the function HTTP.get is going to return immediately. And what it's going to return is a promise object. And so that promise kind of encapsulates this request that is currently being made and so on that promise object there is a function called then which is basically where we bind a callback uh, we say when that promise completes then do this stuff and we can pass in a function to be called on success and a function to be called on error but i've elided that code to keep the slide short we will see it in the um when we look through the code of the real running example in the other video. So this was just kind of a reminder on why the array var controller is scope HTTP, function of scope comma HTTP. Well, the array contains the names, the dependencies. Angular.js will pass in scope and the HTTP service. If you miss them out and just declare a function, your code will work in development, but it will break if the JavaScript's condensed because uh, you'd lose the um, the information about the names of the dependencies that you need. How do we actually invoke our module? Again, we will see this in the live code, but so somewhere in the JavaScript, we're going to have some code that says angular.module of GitHub profiles, comma, followed by an array. And that's going to declare this module should be instantiated, and in the array would be the, the other modules that this depends on, in this case, none. <coughs> Pardon me. Inside the HTML, somewhere in the HTML, we'll see div ng app equals GitHub profiles. So telling Angular.js, look in the Angular module GitHub profiles that I've declared. And between those tags, it should be looking for components, looking for directives that have been declared on that module. And so sure enough, there's the profile fetcher directive that we defined being invoked. <coughs> Pardon me. Something I'm not going to show you in this example is routing or routing. Um, typically, we use the idea that we type in a URL and we hit enter and it goes to that particular URL and we click on a link that has another URL in it and it makes another request and gets back a fresh page. With modern HTML5 apps and single page apps, we can have links that look like URLs, but that don't actually make a GET request, um, but that just call in the JavaScript inside your app. So it all kind of looks from the outside as if we were visit really visiting another URL, but actually we're just doing behavior within, within our app. And we can make the back and forward buttons work as well. Uh, the reason this is possible is because modern browsers have infrastructure in them to make this possible. They have um, functions that let you hook into uh, what's called the history API to do this. And um, there's routing modules for Angular.js that will do this for you. So typically what you end up doing is you end up declaring, uh, including another script that brings in, um, say, Angular Router or Angular UI's router, and those will do all the hooking into the history API and give you a directive. And so then on the page, you would put an element that has a directive from that module. So the one I've shown here, div UI-view, that is the directive for Angular UI's routing module to say, and now at this point, I want you to put in all the elements that I've declared as being what you show for this route, for this URL. 
Um, so that's possibly a slightly long way of saying, okay, we're, we're not going to look at routing in this video, um, but the infrastructure that does this for you is you bring in another module, it hooks into the history API, and it then gives you directives to put into your page, as well as um, functions that you call on the module to declare what your routes should look like. I should mention a little bit about alternatives to Angular.js, and one in particular that's kind of interesting to talk about is React.js, uh, which is from Facebook. Angular.js is from Google, React.js is from Facebook. And React.js has components that are fairly similar in concept to directives. Uh, they just do the view part, it doesn't do the HTTP service we saw, and it doesn't really do the, injection, uh, the dependency injection that we saw either. Uh, so it just does the components that are a bit like the directives. And um, at a high level, those are sort of fairly similar, where you're, you're wanting to be able to put components into the page, and you've got some data in JavaScript, and you're wanting to synchronize how that is then displayed uh, on the page. Behind the scenes, the implementation between React.js and Angular.js is quite different. Uh, React is apparently a little bit faster. Uh, so the way Angular.js does its binding is behind the scenes, every time it thinks something might have updated, it does what's called dirty checking. It remembers what the value was last time it updated the page, and it looks through those objects that you've bound into the page using the curly braces, and it goes, OK, has that object changed since I last uh, updated the page? It has, OK, I better update that bit of the page again. It hasn't, OK, I can move on and have a look at the next object, see if that one's updated. Uh, and so it does this every time it looks as though something has changed uh, in the data. It does this dirty checking when it runs through all of the things that have been bound into the page, sees if they've changed, and updates the page accordingly. React.js takes a different approach to this. React.js, whenever it thinks something might have changed, it regenerates all of the HTML of the page. But it doesn't regenerate it in the browser's DOM, in the browser's document object model. It regenerates it behind the scenes in JavaScript, just as a, uh, a, a, a an unlinked document object model. And it then compares what's in your browser, what's on screen in your browser, with this uh, behind the scenes document object model that it's generated. And it does a diff. It works out what the differences are and what changes it makes and it needs to make to what it's showing in your browser most efficiently to make it match what it's generated. The reason it does this uh, is because it can't just replace the HTML that's showing in your browser with what it's generated, because there's some things that you do with the page, such as scrolling in scroll boxes or things that you do in iframes, um, there's things that you do that are stateful, where you've scrolled in, in the scroll box, that, that's a bit of state. But it's a bit of state that's not reflected in the HTML. There, there's no HTML attribute that says how far down that scroll box you've scrolled, or how far down the page even you've scrolled. And so if it was to just replace the HTML of your page, you'd lose all that state. You'd lose where you'd scrolled to, you'd lose the, whatever you'd been doing in your iframe. And so it can't do that. So instead, it regenerates the HTML behind the scenes and does a very quick comparison and then modifies the bits of the page that it needs to to update the page to match uh, what it regenerated. So that's kind of the, 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 a very short overview of the difference between Angular.js's idea of uh, directives and React.js's idea of components. At a high level, they're quite similar, but how they keep the page in sync with the data is a bit different. A small note on writing apps in JavaScript, and this is to explain something that's going to turn up in the code that we'll see, the very short code that we'll see, that might look a little bit uh, odd if you're not used to JavaScript. JavaScript doesn't have an idea of modules, and so what this means is you get a potential for namespace clashes, two different scripts calling a variable by the same name a different variable by the same name. So one of the examples was that the uh, jQuery module declares a variable called dollar. And lots of other scripts also declared a variable called dollar. And so if you're including both scripts, what should dollar be set to? Should it be set to the one from jQuery or should it be set to the one from the other script? 
and you could get odd sorts of behaviors from uh, these names colliding. JavaScript doesn't have an idea of modules, but it does have something that we can kind of use in that way. It has closures. Um, so what we do is we declare an anonymous function and we do our stuff inside that anonymous function and immediately call it. And so the idea of this is that all of the stuff inside that function we've just declared is uh, all those variables are local variables to that function. So we've just declared a function with lots of local variables and then called it and then thrown away the function. And so this means that uh, those variables won't get exposed in the global namespace and won't clash with anything. So where in that function I go var dollar equals my value, well it's set to my value inside that function but not outside that function. Globally nothing outside that function can see dollar. But if we do want to expose it we can. We can say something like window which is a global object dot dollar equals dollar. And so we, we can we can then expose the variables we want to uh, as we wish. Uh, thing about it being closures rather than uh, rather than just functions is to do with uh, when, when I say we throw away the function. Well, we've thrown away the reference to the function, but actually stuff from inside that function um, that we that we call that we pass around uh, would still be able to have access to the local variables from when we ran that when we ran that function. It doesn't kind of doesn't get completely thrown away if things are still referencing it to it from inside. Uh, but okay, so, th so this is just a very quick explanation of that particular format of text. It's the way that we can isolate uh, a module of code uh, in JavaScript uh, so that we don't accidentally uh, publish variables that we don't want to in the global namespace and end up with clashes.